And uh, when Fernando wrote that uh, to me, the uh, scientific committee of about nine people had to uh, choose a replacement. And we all agreed with no hesitation to choose Antoine Sung. So let me tell you a little bit about Antoine. Antoine just finished his PhD at Princeton in, in uh, June, June, right? And uh, this is rather remarkable. How come uh, the committee was so happy to choose Antoine to replace uh, Fernando? Antoine has written uh, eight papers. You can look on his site and see. He's been a student at Princeton for four years of Fernando. And uh, the fifth paper, so it's three papers back, uh, is a paper that he signed in common with Fernando and uh, uh, Andre Neves, in which uh, he introduced the notion of equi a distribution of minimal submanifolds, which he's going to talk about today, which was completely new to minimal surface theory, as you'll see. And in the sixth paper, he managed to solve the problem that everybody's been trying to solve for the last, uh, uh, since 1982, 20, 40 years or so, or some less, less than 40 years, a conjecture of Yao, which said that on a closed three-dimensional Ramanian manifold, there are an infinite number of disjoint embedded minimal surfaces. So think about this for geodesics on convex surfaces. Finding geodesics on convex surfaces that are embedded and how many there are, it's just, uh, certainly a subject that uh, we know in geometry. In any case, uh, Antoine managed in the sixth paper to solve that problem. He was able to prove that any, well, Brahmanian manifold, let's talk about it, contains an infinite number of closed embedded minimal surfaces. A marvelous theorem that goes to what everybody's trying to do for many years. We started proving one exists, that was a great achievement, and uh, now an infinite number exists in almost every manifold uh, up to dimension seven, between three and seven. Um, let's, uh, it is true that his work certainly it's like you know, climb, climbing a great mountain in mathematics. People climb the mountain, climb the mountain, and he was climbing with them, and because of the work that was done previously, he was able to prove this theorem. So certainly, uh, Andre Neves and Fernando and, uh, and others have uh, greatly contributed to the work he's going to talk about today. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the very nice words. Uh, it's my first time in IMPA, and I'm very excited. Uh, I have to thank my now former advisor for not being here, right? <laughs> so thank you, Fernando. Uh, so my goal today is to talk to you about some recent advances uh, on the theory of existence of minimal surfaces. Um, and the outline of my talk is first to introduce you to this question of Yao and some ideas uh, of coming from min-max. Min-max theory is the theory that enables you to construct uh, minimal surfaces. And then that's going to take uh, a big part of my talk. And then I'm going to talk a bit uh, about the generic equidistribution result that we obtained with uh, Fernando and Andre. And finally, if I have time, I'm going to talk a little bit about the topology of these minimal surfaces you're producing. So the motivating, the guiding question of this talk is this conjecture of Yao. Uh, it just says that in any Riemannian closed three manifold, there should be infinitely many minimal surfaces. So the key word here is uh, minimal surfaces. Let me uh, first define what this is. Uh, you start with the um, closed surface embedded in a three manifold. Let us focus on three dimensional manifolds. And you say that sigma is a minimal surface if and only if it's going to, to have one of the three conditions that I'm going to list and they're all equivalent, okay? So the first condition is that its mean curvature H is uh, vanishing. So it's zero everywhere on the surface. Remember that, remember that the mean curvature 
is the sum of the two principal curvatures. So that already appeared in the first talk of uh, Etienne Gis. So if you have a two-dimensional surface embedded in some three manifold uh, at each point, you have exactly, so, so you have two um, orthogonal directions in which the, the surface is the most curved, okay? And so here I, I draw these two lines. And so these two lines, they each have a curvature. You take the sum, that gives you the mean curvature. And if the mean curvature is zero at every point, that means at, at every point you look something like a saddle point, okay? So that's the first condition. The second condition is a local one. Uh, it says that um, it's minimal if sigma minimizes the area in small balls. What do I mean by that? Okay, so you, you imagine your surface in, um, in M. You look at the point and a small ball uh, centered at this point. And you look at deformation of sigma. So, so you, you deform sigma only in this little ball. You let sigma as it is uh, outside of the ball. And if every time you move sigma inside the ball, you have to increase the area, you say that locally it minimizes the area. And that means that the whole um, surface is a minimal surface. The last uh, definition, which is the one I prefer, is that a minimal surface is a critical point of the area functional. Um, so that's a global condition, at least psychologically, right? So the, the heuristic picture is that you have this um, huge space um, of two surfaces, okay? It's a crazy space. of closed two surfaces. And um, inside this huge space, you have uh, very remarkable points, which are critical, the critical points of the area. So the altitude here represents the area. And our goal today is to construct, is to find these critical points, okay? So you can think of minimal surfaces as generalization of, of geodesics that appeared in the previous talk. Um, that's a good analogy, but it's like brothers and sisters. So they're similar, minimal surfaces and geodesics, but uh, if you look closer, they're behaving quite differently. So we'll try to, uh, to uh, see more about that. And so to sum up the goal, the, the, the goal of this talk is to investigate the space of um, two surfaces inside M that I denote by Z, endowed with this natural area functional. And what you want to see is uh, how complicated this space is. For example, Yao's conjecture can be reformulated as there should be infinitely many critical points of this functional in this uh, space of two surfaces, okay? So let me first give you some examples of uh, minimal surfaces because so, so you can think of them um, for now as just two-dimensional geodesics. Uh, so for example, one rather trivial example is you take a um, flat torus of dimension three, you take any section, that gives you uh, two torus, which is a minimal surface. Right here, I draw a geodesic. You can do the same thing, but uh, in a three sphere, the round three sphere. You take the equator. That's an S2 embedded in S3, and it's a minimal surface. Um, and any such um, equator is a minimal surface. That's great and easy to see. What, what is less easy to see is that uh, in the flat torus, there are other minimal surfaces, and they look like this. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a nice video showing you how it looks like with Eric Satis music in the background. But 
you see that this Gruyere-like uh, surface is, uh, I tell you, minimal, and you have to imagine that you have to identify the opposite boundaries, okay? So that it's a closed surface so without boundary uh, embedded in the um, flat torus. And that is due to uh, Hermann Schwartz, the Schwartz of Cauchy Schwartz. And these minimal surfaces can be arbitrarily complicated. Then they can have arbitrarily large uh, genus. So that was in the flat tours. What about the round S3? So in the round S3, you also have infinitely many other minimal surfaces, and they were constructed by Lawson. Um, so Lawson constructed minimal surfaces psi g for any g. G is the genus of the surface. So for any genus, you have a corresponding psi G, a minimal surface with genus G. And as G is going to infinity, uh, what psi G looks like is uh, the union of two equators like this, but uh, desingularized. So instead, so you have to imagine that you have two S2 intersecting along a line in your three-dimensional sphere. And you replace that um, line of intersection by something like this, using a multitude of little necks. Okay, this is what psi g looks like when g is uh, very, very large. So when the genus is one, when the, the g is one, psi g is nothing else than the so-called uh, Clifford torus. which can be defined simply by a product of uh, two circles of cap. And so it's a nice symmetric torus sitting inside the, the, the three sphere. Uh, so before talking about the um, existent theory of uh, minimal surfaces, I just wanted to give a quick background about what uh, has been done in the field of minimal surfaces. So it's going to be very brief. It's a biased list of some results, not directly related to my talk. So in general, three manifolds, Kolding and Minikazi studied minimal surfaces of uh, bounded genus, and they were able to say something about this kind of object, so minimal surfaces with bounded genus. Uh, using that, uh, people could tell, say something about minimal surfaces in um, the flat Euclidean space. Uh, for example, Mix and Rosenberg proved the, uh, the uniqueness of the helicoid. The helicoid is a, um, a very famous minimal surface. And there were some other works by Mix, Paris, Ross. In the round S3, there were some uh, advances too. So Fernando, Conan Marquez, and Andre Neves, for example, showed that this torus, the Xi I, the Xi one, this Clifford torus, is the smallest area minimal surface after the equator. So in some sense, in the round S3, the simplest minimal surface is uh, the equators. The next one is the Clifford Tours. This is what they proved. Uh, and that was uh, instrumental in their proof of uh, the so-called Birmore conjecture. Uh, another result is uh, the one of Brendel, who showed that this same um, torus is, is, is actually the only embedded minimal torus in the round S3. So that's another uniqueness theorem. All right, but today we want to talk, so these results are about some given minimal surfaces, but today we want to talk about how to construct uh, minimal surfaces in general manifolds. So remember that uh, minimal surfaces are a critical point of the area function. So how do we construct critical points of a functional? The first thing you want to try is to just minimize the functional, and then you get a critical point, which is a minimizer. Uh, and in our case, it's going to correspond to a minimal surface, right? So in this cartoon picture, the point that we want to get is this one. Let's see if that works. 
Um, so when the topology of the manifold M is complicated enough, then that works. Uh, let me draw you a picture. In the case of geodesics, because really it's uh, very similar. So you, you, you start with a bumpy uh, kind of torus, okay? And you want to prove the existence of a um, closed geodesic on this. So the thing you do is, well, you take a non-trivially, so topologically non-trivial loop, and you move this loop until you cannot decrease the length anymore, right? You, you move it, until you reach uh, a curve that, that you cannot decrease anymore. So the length, you cannot decrease the length anymore. And this curve gives you a geodesic on that picture. So you can do exactly the same thing in a higher dimension. This is what I tried to write here. So if the um, second homology group of M is non-trivial, then you take a representative, uh, a sequence of representative minimizing the area. And what general theory tells you is that um, this sequence of representatives are going to converge to something which is a smooth surface, a minimal surface. Okay, so the, the picture here is that we picked some point here and they're converging to a minimal surface. So, this is all nice and good, but if you don't have topology, then this is useless. For example, on the two sphere, if you want to get a geodesic, you cannot just take a curve and try to minimize its length. You just get a point, all right? Um, so for, for, for example, in the case of uh, the three sphere, this minimum is going to correspond to the trivial empty surface. So that's no good, no good. And the question is, so for general ambient manifold without topology, how can you construct this kind of critical point? So how can you construct minimal surfaces? Um, from that cartoon picture, it's kind of clear that most critical points are going to be uh, saddle points, right? You cannot hope to find a lot of minimizers like this. So you can, it, it's natural to try what is called mountain pass arguments or min max arguments that are very familiar to people in PDE. Um, so Birkhoff was the first to, to uh, introduced this kind of min-max arguments that I'm going to talk about to construct the geodesics, closed geodesics um, on the two-sphere. So actually this question was raised and half proved by Poincaré, I think. And I think it's going to, to be the subject of the next talk uh, of Etienne Gis. Anyway, um, for higher dimension, the situation is very, very complicated. So uh, a Constructing critical points of the area functional came up much later. It's due to Algren and Pitts. So what they could prove is that in total generality, in any Riemannian three manifold, you get a minimal surface. There exists a non-empty, uh, nice, nicely embedded minimal surface. So I want to try to uh, convey to you the main idea behind this. So the next slide is going to be the most technical slide of the talk. Uh, if you survive this after, after that, we chill, it's okay. Um, so what's the idea? We, we, we saw that direct minimization fails because it gives you something empty. So you want to still do some kind of minimization, but, but you want to get something non-trivial. The first um, observation here which is due to uh, Amgren, is that this huge space of closed two surfaces lying in M, it, 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 it's um, carrying topology. So the fundamental group of this huge space is Z2, meaning that you can consider non-trivial loops, right? For example, on this, uh, 
uh, th this huge space. This fact tells you that you can find some non-trivial loop in that space. Um, and let me tell you that our goal is to uh, get from a general way, so to get the existence of this critical point that we see here. Um, so once you start with this non-trivial loop, what you can see is that the maximum here, the maximum altitude, is never going to be zero. So it's bounded below actually by the height of this guy. So let's try to minimize the maximal altitude here. So you, you get a sequence of loops in your space of closed surfaces. And you try to minimize the maximal altitude on each loop, okay? So at the end, well, these maximal altitude points with a little bit of luck, they're going to converge to a critical point. And this is simply the idea uh, behind, um, behind min max in general and min max in particular for minimal surfaces. So um, let's see, this is the, this gibberish is, is what I just said. So you take a sequence of non-trivial loops and you try to minimize the maximal altitude here. So you take, so let me read this. You have a sequence of non-trivial loops, gamma i, so gamma one, gamma two. And in each gamma i, you, each gamma i again is a one parameter of surfaces, okay? In each gamma i, you pick a surface <laughs> that maximizes the altitude inside the loop. And the claim is that you got a sequence of surfaces and they converge to a minimal surface. These points are converging to um, a critical point. So this is more or less speaking what Algren and Pitts did. Uh, and and uh, so obviously this convergence here uh, is going to be very weak. So the goal was for them to show that this guy is actually a, a nice minimal surface. Anyway, so that was the technical part. So once, uh, this fact, yeah, okay. Okay, so just that the fundamental group is Z2. Um, Oh, of Z, so, uh, sorry, so Z through my talk is this space of uh, two surfaces, okay? So, uh, so uh, it, it's, okay, so it's the connected component of say the uh, trivial empty set. And uh, to be more rigorous, it's a space of current that you take uh, modulo two. So it's a space of generalized, not smooth, uh, closed two surfaces and uh, this space carries topology. Yeah, yeah, in, uh, indeed, because uh, of some group structure, actually. Uh, so, yeah, so in this talk, for minimal surfaces, I'm really interested in embedded guys, embedded guys. So these theories are giving you embedded guys without self-intersection. And we will see that uh, the corresponding theory for geodesics is really different in the sense that for geodesics, it gives you uh, in general, um, so closed geodesic, periodic geodesics, but with self-intersection. Um, so Amgren Pitts proved the existence of one minimal surface in uh, in any three-dimensional manifold, that's very nice. Uh, and the natural question is how many of these objects do you have? So given a three-manifold, how many minimal surfaces do you have? Um, and that's the conjecture. And it was proved after the successive efforts of um, 
so Fernando and Andre, Fernando Coda Marquez and Andre Neves were the first really to, to tackle this, to, to attack this problem using min-max. And they proved a particular case. Um, some other people uh, named here, Irie, Marquez, Neves, Trudor, Mantoulidis, and Sindro, were able to prove the conjecture when the metric is picked at random. So for a generic metric, you do have infinitely many minimal surfaces. And uh, last year, we proved the general case. So the remark here is what is happening for geodesics? Because the corresponding question for geodesics really makes sense, right? Um, and the answer is that in, in, the, in the 80s, Franks and Bangert, they were able to prove the existence of infinitely many closed geodesics on any closed surface. Um, I have to say that the techniques they're using are really different because for geodesics, you have a whole array of techniques uh, coming, for example, from dynamical systems. And, and the paper of Franks is purely dynamical. Um, but the link between two-dimensional minimal surfaces and dynamical system remains to be uh, understood. I mean, there's, it's not clear what to expect. Um, so the, the analog question for geodesics was proved by Franks and Bangert. Also note that for certain helixoids, you only have three closed embedded <laughs> geodesics. Uh, so this is where the situation with minimal surfaces is different. So for minimal surfaces, again, you have infinitely many embedded uh, minimal surfaces. For geodesics, that is not true. have some ellipsoid where the only three closed embedded geodesics are the, the one that you can imagine, the axis. Anyway, another remark is that uh, Ken and Markovich Earlier proved a version of this conjecture for hyperbolic manifolds in the wake of their solution of, of the subgroup, uh, surface subgroup conjecture. So they're doing that for hyperbolic manifolds. Um, let me tell you more about min max theory, a little bit more. So I think it's very useful to um, make the analogy between min-max theory and just the min-max theory for the Laplacian, okay? So you have min-max for two-dimensional surfaces on the one side, and on the other side you have the Laplacian. 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 Uh, <laughs> And so the first fact, which is the generalization of uh, the, 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 the fact I told you about is this thing, which is that this huge space of two surfaces is actually homotopically equivalent to a infinite dimensional projective space. What's good about an infinite dimensional projective space is that all the Betty numbers are non-zero. That means uh, you, you expect by Morse inequalities, you expect the area functional to have a lot of critical points, right? This, these are just the intuition coming from finite dimensional manifolds. So that's a good starting point. And from that, from exactly what I just said, you can kind of cook up some uh, min max numbers. Uh, so for example, omega zero is this, omega one is this. The, uh, so omega one is the altitude of this point. And you have a bunch of, so a sequence, a whole sequence of uh, numbers going to infinity. And you can really think of this as a kind of nonlinear spectrum. Um, so you have these numbers that really correspond to just eigenvalues. Uh, 
Um, and the key is that these abstract numbers are related to minimal surfaces by min-max theory. So for any p, omega p is the area with of a certain minimal surface, sigma p. So here, the, in the analogy, minimal surface would correspond just to eigenfunctions. Um, so that comes from the theory of Amgren Pitts. So the theory gives you automatically that it's embedded. But, but if you apply this theory to uh, geodesics, you don't get embedded. That is weird. But in any higher dimension, you get embedded things. There's really no clear explanation. I, I wouldn't be able to, to explain that point. But the, the point is just that, OK, the theory gives you embedded guys. Um, the next thing is that you have a kind of by law for these numbers meaning that the omega p, you know really how they grow. Uh, so you have a by law. Yeah. OK, obviously, people call it by law because of this analogy. Uh, and in particular, you see that omega p grow as uh, p to the power 1 over 3. OK. And this quantity converges to a constant that's, by the way, unknown, a constant times the volume of m, the ambient manifold, 2 is on the power, of course. Um, and, and so I think that the analogy between geodesics and uh, eigenfunctions are, are much better understood. Uh, but I find it beautiful that there is still this analogy for two-dimensional minimal surfaces. And so for higher dimensional minimal surfaces, uh, you still have this analogy between the Laplacian and, and um, minimal surfaces. OK, so now so, so, so the, the, the conjecture of Yao was uh, proved using techniques coming from min-max theory that I just described. Um, so now we know that in any closed manifold, there exist infinitely many such objects, such minimal surfaces. Great. So what can we say uh, about the position right, of these minimal surfaces? There's this ambient, uh, ambient space, and you have uh, a lot of minimal surfaces. Where are these minimal surfaces? Uh, we don't really have an answer to that, but generically, we do have an answer to that. So generically, what Iria and Marcus Neves showed was that if the metric of M is picked at random, then if you take the union of closed minimal surfaces, it's dense. It's a dense set, meaning that they're actually everywhere. Um, and here, generic means uh, generic in the bare sense. This is how these people proved uh, the generic version of Yao's conjecture. This is, by the way, a lot stronger than just infinitely many. But we would like to quantify this denseness. OK, so the, the union is dense. But what can we say uh, quantitatively? And so by pushing their methods, um, Fernando, Andre, and I, so we proved that for a generic metric, there exists a sequence of minimal surfaces that is equidistributed. It is e an equidistribution in the sense that I think uh, we expect, which is that um, you take any function f, you take the normalized um, sum of the integrals of f over these surfaces, and this quantity converges to the, the average, uh, the average of f over the manifold. Right, so, so, right. Um, 
so generically you have such a sequence. You can find such a sequence. Uh, let me mention that in the proof of both these results, the crucial tool is weirdly this VI law that I talked to you about, which, is, uh, which gives you the growth of uh, the omega p in terms of uh, p. Um, so uh, in this formula, you see that on the one hand, you, you have these omega p, and they're related to minimal surfaces. On the other hand, you have something which is depending on the volume. Um, so I don't know if it's intuitive, but you might expect by deforming the metric, you would deform the volume. You would increase the volume. So that that's why you would get some information on the minimal surfaces because of this formula. This is the formula that makes the link uh, between the two. Uh, another remark is that there's this famous uh, result by Ratner and Shah. Uh, this is a related result. So if they proved, so Shah proved that in a closed hyperbolic theory manifold, if you take a completely, like totally geodesic surface, it is either closed or equidistributed, which is uh, pretty beautiful. So either uh, the surface closes on itself or it becomes dense and very well equidistributed because your surf totally geodesic surface in that case is going to be equidistributed in the space of, uh, uh, in the Grassmannian bundle. Exactly, thank you for <laughs> giving me this counter example. So, uh, this is for minimal, this is for two dimensional surfaces. And this is another point where uh, two dimension and one dimension are really different because this is false, as you said, this is false for geodesics. Geodesics are totally geodesic uh, manifold of, of dimension one. But it is true in higher dimension. In a higher dimension hypersurfaces that are totally geodesic have this property. So thank you for mentioning that. That's another point where ge geodesics and minimal surfaces disagree pretty strongly. Um, and I don't understand why. Mm. So I'm too fast. Uh, <laughs> Let me say what I can say more about this slide. Uh, yes, yes, please. So it's a dimensional constant. It's like, it's like the usual Vylaw here. I forgot the concrete expression, but in the usual Vylaw for the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, everything is explicit to so your constant A naught has uh, some expression involving pi, of course. Um, and here, we the, the mystery is that we know it converges to some, so the A naught is not zero, okay? Uh, um, but it's a positive constant, depending only on the dimension, we have no idea, we have no prediction of what this should be. Um, what else? So, another, th yeah. So it's in the C0 sense of bear. Uh, so um, in the bear sense, meaning that the set for which this theorem is true is a countable intersection of open dead sets in the C infinity topology. C infinity topology. Y yeah, that's a good question. So we don't know. We don't know. Um, we expect it to be true, generically. So here you have to take the sum and then normalize the, the whole sum, but maybe it is conceivable that you just need one minimal surface. Uh, let me write it down. So, so here, in the theorem, you have, you have to have the sum because I'm not claiming that this guy, that this term is going to uh, be average. 
of that. Right, and, and so I don't know about this. Um, an example of equidistribution in that sense, not in this sense, is, uh, is very simple. So you look at the three sphere and you just take a random sequence of equators, right? A random sequence of equators, they're going to equidistribute in that sense. Um, another example where actually you do have equidistribution in this stronger uh, sense is the, um, the example, so let me see if I can find it. The, the Schwartz minimal surfaces. The Schwartz minimal surfaces, they become denser and denser, they remain connected and you can kind of check that uh, this minimal surface becomes uh, more and more um, dense and better and better equidistributed. Uh, we could take C0, yes, but uh, wait, so where? Ah, yes, yes. Yes, please. Um, oh, so no, so the, 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 the convergence is exactly in that sense of, of distribution, I guess. So you take any function. Uh, oh, you mean C infinity for the function here? Oh, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, we could take a measurable like, integral function. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's a weakness of the theorem, which is that this sequence is not canonical and it does not directly comes from this. So it's not exactly this sequence. No, no, no. You have to deform them. You have to deform them. And this is where you need that the metric is generic. So you do some min max on some metric and then you redeform my metric. You redo min max uh, and you, you, you get all the minimal surface. Anyway, so you have to modify the metric and so there's no canonical way to obtain these uh, sigma p. The conjecture is that there's this semi-canonical way which would be that you just take these sigma p. So these sigma p's are, are not directly uh, corresponding to the, the omega p. Uh, I'm not even sure it's true, actually. Oh, oh. So the, the techniques are different. Uh, I mean, uh, it's different for, for experts. So here we need, for example, the bylaw. But if you want to get rid uh, of the genericity of the metric, you don't really need the bylaw. You, you just need sublinearity, and it's uh, counting arguments. It's, it's pretty different from that. So it's more arithmetic a little bit. Right. <laughs> uh, so let me finish by mentioning a natural question. So you have these uh, uh, nonlinear geometric eigenfunctions, so minimal surfaces sigma p, and you want to know information about what they look like. For example, what is the topology of wh what you just produced, these uh, geometric eigenfunctions? Um, so take sigma p, the sequence of minimal surfaces you just produced. Uh, what is known? So generically, you know that by Chodosh, Montolidis, and Sindro, that for generic metric, actually, uh, the genus is at least linear, is at least linear. So it grows uh, pretty fast. And there is a conjecture in the field saying that this should be optimal. So the genus of these nonlinear eigenfunction, these minimal surfaces, should be linear. Um, and you can compare that conjecture to a uh, um, 
a conjecture of Yao for nodal sets, right, of, of uh, eigenfunctions. So what is known? Uh, well, so you, you, in some special metrics, you, you, you have the perfect answer, and this is due to many people, so Ross, Savo, Urbano, Lucas Ambrosio, Carlotto, and Sharp. So for example, in the round sphere, this is true. In the flat torus, this is true. But in general, we don't have uh, linearity, so it is still an open problem, and uh, so I can show that uh, it's polynomial, but uh, I cannot show that it's linear, this genus. So this is an open question. <sighs> and this was my last slide, actually. <laughs> So, so maybe you want some coffee, uh, or you have more questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, what kind of lamina minimal laminations? So can you repeat the question? I'm not sure. So I think using this kind of min-max techniques, you have an a priori uh, area bound. So you, you, you cannot really hope to get uh, something that's going to converge to a minimal lamination uh, using min-max of this sort. So I don't really know. Uh, I don't really know. So, so technically what happens first is that you have to choose the right space. It's like, as you roll, you have to choose the right space of two surfaces, and here the right space is Z, which is the space of uh, two uh, cycle. So these are currents, integral currents, integral currents. mod two, and the mod two is actually uh, important to get topology. So remember that this space is an RP infinity, okay? So from that, you already see that you will need a lot of geometric measure theory. Uh, so when you do this procedure, um, so s each sigma uh, one is s an element here, and this sigma i, which are current, they are also varifold. So you look at them as varifolds. As varifolds, so it's another generalization of the notion of uh, surfaces. As varifolds, they are going to converge to a nice varifold, but the whole point uh, of the theory is to show that this limiting varifold is a smooth object. So the support of the, the varifold is a smooth minimal surface. And to show that, um, so this, the fact that this varifold exists is due to Arngren, who, by the way, introduced the notion of varifold for that problem. And to show that this varifold has a support that is nice minimal surface, something that we want, that is due to Pitts. And technically, it's it's complicated. There's a, um, a combinatorial argument. Um, saying that this stationary varifold is not just any stationary varifold, it comes with some um, minimizing structure. But remember that for really area minimizing minimal surfaces, you have uh, good smooth, uh, good regularity results by 
Jim Simons. Um, and so using some complicated argument that I can talk to you uh, later, Pitts guessed that this guy is a uh, smooth minimal surface. Right, so cont contrary to eigenfunctions, uh, for minimal surfaces, min-max method just gives you uh, a, a, a ridiculously small amount of, of minimal surface in the huge space of uh, critical points here. Uh, min-max just gives you some uh, preferred ones. So you expect to have much, much more minimal surfaces, you just don't know how to get them. Do you mean in higher dimensions? Uh, yes. Fr coming from this theory, you get only smooth objects. Um, uh, yeah, singular one exists. You don't really get them using that. Um, there are other min-max theories. Maybe let me mention some names. Uh, so. Sachs Uhlenbeck is a pretty famous one. So other min max. You have Sachs Uhlenbeck. In, th in their case, you get branched minimal spheres. Immersed branched immersed minimal spheres. So Sachs Uhlenbeck. Um, you have something very similar to, to what I just said by uh, Marco Zoraco and also Pedro Gaspar. And you have another yet uh, kind of minimal min max method due to Tristan Rivière. Uh, and in, I think, this case and this case, you get branched immersed minimal surface. But I don't think there's a systematic way to get minimal surface with singularity. They could not prove that they're smooth. Yes. Uh, yes. So thank you. Uh, oh, uh, yes. Yes. Exactly. That's exactly the same problem. The danger is that you. By abstract min max theory, you get uh, sigma, and then two times sigma, and three times sigma. And it's exactly the same problem, but you have to, uh, contrary to geodesics, you have to use other kind of arguments to rule this out. Mm. But it's exactly the same problem that occurs. Yes. No, you use the asymptotic growth of the omega p. So the fact that it's sublinear. So you, you, you have to use something else. Higher dimensions, we expect everything that I said here to be true in all higher dimensions, except that in very high dimensions, so bigger than seven, you, you have to allow some singular set in your minimal surface that you, you, you produce. You cannot group them. So higher dimension and dimension of geodesics, completely different. Yes. Oh, yes, that's it. <laughs> No, sorry. 